nice to see a full room for security, so I'm always enjoying that. So I'm going to introduce you to the OWASP top 10 in the world of Angular. So essentially, for those who don't know the real meaning of the OWASP top 10, the OWASP top 10 is an awareness document. It's something created by the OWASP Foundation to raise awareness about the really dangerous problems in web applications we face today. Well, today is kind of relevant. They have a new version every couple of years. So every couple of years, they build a new list of what they observe in real applications like these problems are there. They look at the impact of the problems. They look at how prevalent they are and how easy it is to exploit them. And based on that, they create a list. And you can see the 2007 version right here on the screen uh, showing you what the problems are in 2017. This is the OWASP top 10. What I'm going to talk about is how the OWASP top 10 applies to Angular applications. Because Angular applications are different. They are not really traditional web applications. You don't really generate pages on the server and send them to the browser for rendering, no. You load the application with traditional requests one time. You have your SPA, your single page application loaded, and at that moment, we're essentially calling APIs, we're doing things on the front end. And that kind of means, if we're talking about Angular, it also means, first of all, that we are kind of separating development. Yes, you can still build things together, but essentially you're going to have front end devs and back end devs, especially in a large organization. Whether it's the same person or not, it's different roles for potentially different people or um, one person who has to split his time between these things. So for the OWASP top 10, this kind of means a few things. So for example, injection is a server-side problem. Injection means SQL injection, command injection, things like that we have on the server, potential problems we typically see there. In the front end, they're a bit less relevant. I wouldn't say extremely irrelevant, but um, in my opinion, uh, we can rearrange the OWASP top 10 to make more sense for Angular. So this is a very personal, uh, biased view. Maybe you don't agree with that. I'm happy to discuss that after the talk as well. But essentially, some of these issues matter more for Angular devs, and other issues are a bit less relevant in the space of Angular applications. I want to talk about three of them. I know it's called the OWASP top 10, but first of all, a few of them are irrelevant. Second of all, I only have 27 minutes left uh, to talk about these things. And I, I tried covering more, and it ended up at like 90 minutes. So I'm, I'm not going to keep you hostage for the rest of the hour. Uh, so let's talk about three here. Let's talk about the top three. And I want to start with cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is a really, really nasty problem. It's essentially an attack where the attacker succeeds in executing JavaScript code in your application. And it occurs anytime some untrusted data ends up in the page, there's a potential cross-site scripting vulnerability. Anytime you put something into the page from a message, from the database, from the API in the backend, and you put it into the page, it's going to cause problems. And we've seen these problems everywhere. And if you want to know how prevalent cross-site scripting is, I can guarantee that almost every application will have them. And recently, we saw one on one of the most, I would say, the most secure pages in the world, the Google search page. Very simple. They have one input field. Yet, because of some weird browser behavior, there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability right there in that page. Just to show you how hard it is to prevent things like cross-site scripting. That's the bad part, the sad part of the story. Let's talk about XSS in Angular. That's a good part of the story. So the Angular team actually knew what they were doing when they built Angular, which is a good thing, since we all use Angular. So uh, thank you for that. So let's, let's look at what this means in Angular. On top, you have your untrusted code. So this is your Angular code. You put some untrusted data right in there. Untrusted data is something coming from user input. Doesn't matter how it ends up in the application, whether it's from a database or from a parameter or from an input field, whatever. It's the value that matters. And in this case, you see the value hello. That's kind of expected. And then somebody gives you a bit extra data, gives you an image tag. And that image is going to try to load unicorns.png which, of course, does not exist. So it's going to trigger the on error handler instead, and it's going to pop up an alert dialog when this gets executed. This is a textbook example for cross-site scripting. If you have a vulnerability, chances are that this payload will always work regardless of the scenarios that you're trying to exploit. Interesting. A side note here. The alert is really annoying, like this pop-up in the browser, and you have to click it away, and it keeps coming if you keep executing this payload. So it really annoys the hell out of you, but it's not really dangerous. But this is a very simple proof of concept. So a real attacker, obviously, is not going to insert alerts unless they want bug bounty. Then it's a good way to show the vulnerability and collect on the money. But real attackers are going to insert real payloads. And the moment they can execute JavaScript, they can do whatever they want. If I can execute JavaScript in your application, I can make it do whatever I want. I can uh, start using 
permission API based APIs. I can grab images from the webcam if your app has permission to do that. I can use the microphone. I can get location information. I can deface your web page, which is if they only do that, you got away very easy. That's good. But I can also start sending requests to the backend in the name of the user, and there's basically nothing you can do to stop that. So cross-site scripting, essentially for Angular, means game over. The moment XSS happens, if the attacker is skilled enough, you lose. There's simply no way to recover from that. That's a side note. So cross-site scripting, really, really dangerous. How does Angular handle this? Well, if you output this data in Angular, you're going to see that. Because Angular is not stupid. Angular knows very well, hey, I'm putting data into the page here with the curly brackets. That's exactly what that means. So I'm going to make sure that this data will be seen as data by the browser. The browser doesn't see this as code. The browser will not even look at how to execute that. Because the browser knows, oh, this is data. And it's going to show you the data. So in this case, that output is safe. That output will never trigger the execution of script code. In no circumstances, because everywhere where we put this, Angular applies something called strict contextual escaping, which means Angular is going to look like, hey, you're putting this right there, and I know that these things are dangerous there, so I'm not going to allow that to happen. And they have you covered. And that's good. This is awesome. Old applications, PHP, Java server pages, ASP, you had to do this yourself. Modern applications, server-side frameworks have something very similar today, but Angular applications on the front end do this automatically. And Angular is not alone. The other ones do it as well. React does it, and Ember does it, and I'm pretty sure Vue does it, even though I'm not too familiar with it, and so on and so on. So this is good. This is a massive step forward, so that's awesome. Of course, outputting HTML, if you want some fancy output, your business users are not going to be very happy. You're going to see HTML instead of very nice images or paragraphs or headers or whatnot. So this is only used for, for simple outputs. A name, sure, that's going to work. There's no HTML in your name unless you're really unfortunate, but you're going to have a lot of other problems with HTML-based names as well. I can guarantee that. But let's say you want some outputs that does contain some HTML. Well, Angular has the inner HTML binding. This is not a DOM API. It's not a DOM inner HTML. It's the Angular-based property to bind data into the DOM. And if you give it output like that, what's going to happen? Well, Angular is going to output that, and it knows like, hey, you want some HTML in the output. So, well, actually, you get the image. Well, you, you don't get the image because it doesn't exist, but you don't get the alert either. Because what Angular does here is it knows like, hey, I'm putting stuff, I'm putting untrusted data in inner HTML, and I know that that is a cause for major problems. Angular already knew that in Angular 1, they gave you an error and said, like, no, we're not going to do that. You could fix that error and get it right. But in Angular 2, they do this automatically. Every binding to inner HTML is automatically sanitized. And that means that Angular looks at your data and says, like, whoa, these features, I know that these are good. Like the bold, yeah, I know that's fine. Uh, the image tag, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's harmless. I'm going to allow that. On error attributes, no, I, I don't know what that means, so I'm going to take it out. If I don't know it, it's probably not safe, so I'm going to take it out and make sure you don't end up with any cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in your application. And this is absolutely awesome, because this means that by default, you are protected against cross-site scripting as an Angular developer. And that's pretty cool. Let me give you a few guidelines, because there's a few things you need to know to watch out for. So the good news of the story is that, first of all, you need to get out of the way. Just let Angular do whatever it does, because Angular is really good at that. Just do things the Angular way. Don't try to be smarter than Angular. Just do whatever Angular says. This is how you put data into the DOM, and you're good to go. Because it applies everywhere. The Angular way, binding to an href. You give it a URL like this. Guess what a browser does? Ooh, JavaScript. Boom, executes that. Just like that. However, when you try to do this in Angular, Angular is like, no, no, no. I know that you're putting this in a URL field. And I know that this JavaScript colon thing is very dangerous. Well, actually, Angular doesn't even know it's dangerous. It knows it's not safe because it doesn't recognize it. And it says, like, I'm not allowing that value in that URL field. And that is pretty, pretty awesome. By the way, as a side note, Angular is the only framework that does this by default. The other libraries, like React and Ember, they don't offer features like this. URLs are not protected there. You have to do that yourself as a developer. They don't do sanitization either. You have to do that yourself. It's not necessarily that hard to do it, but you have to figure that out yourself or include additional libraries and hope they offer this protection in a correct way. Angular does all of that automatically, and that's why I'm personally a big fan of Angular here. Second guideline is don't use functions that start with bypass security in the name. 
You can manage that, right? <laughs> Why the bypass security? In Angular 1, the function was just called trust as HTML. And you will find code snippets on Stack Overflow, which we all use to build our applications, that actually misuse that function. And as an unknowing developer, you had no idea unless you actually looked up the documentation and figured it out on your own or watched one of my talks from back in the day. And that's why they renamed this to bypass security, because this will trigger a bell. If you copy paste code from Stack Overflow and it says bypass security, that will make you think like, hmm, what, what should that mean? And that will trigger looking up the documentation and avoiding the use of that function. If you're building libraries, by the way, and you offer unsafe functions, always put something like that in the name because it really works well in triggering developers to notice potential security problems. How does this work? Well, if you feed that untrusted data and you pass it through the function, Angular is not going to protect you. So in this example, giving it the data from before will actually give you that pop-up. Because by the function bypass security, you can tell Angular, this snippet is safe. I vouch for the safety of this snippet. So Angular's like, oh, in that case, I'm not going to do anything. Go ahead. And in this case, it ends up in a bad location. So this is intended for static code snippets. If you want to output a st static code snippet, something you wrote yourself based on a certain condition, then sure, you can use this. But don't ever, ever use this for untrusted data. User-provided input should never pass through this function because you're going to cause cross-site scripting problems. Third guideline, don't use raw DOM APIs. So there are ways to get access to raw DOM elements with element refs. Don't use these APIs to output data into the DOM. Don't set attributes or content with those values because Angular is not in the loop anymore. The moment you get the raw DOM element and start calling APIs on that, Angular cannot protect you. Same thing if you add something like jQuery to your application to do something outside of Angular with jQuery. That's a very bad idea because jQuery uh, requires a lot of internal knowledge to prevent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities because they do a lot of crazy things with the values that you give it. So don't do that. Stick to the Angular way of doing things. Very, very important guideline here. And a final guideline to avoid cross-site scripting here is don't give the user control over resource URLs. Resource URLs are the only place where you need to think about security yourself because Angular cannot protect you there. Let, let me give you an example of a resource URL. Dynamically loading an iframe. The SRC here, this value will automatically trigger the loading of a document the moment you set it. There's no clicking in between, there's nothing in between. It simply triggers that loading immediately. So Angular, if you give it a, a URL like this, it will load a YouTube video. Very easy, very straightforward. However, if you give it data like that, it's going to pop up an alert dialog. I know, why on earth can you put a JavaScript URL in an iframe SRC to pop up? I, I don't know why, but it works. The challenge here is that Angular can't really protect you. Yes, they could determine that you probably don't want to do this. Probably. You shouldn't. But do you want to load YouTube videos? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Do you want to load stuff? What if this value comes from the user and it says like evil.example.com slash hackme.html? Do you want to load that? Probably not, but I don't know. Maybe. So Angular can't really decide that for you. Angular doesn't really know what to do here, so it's going to give you an error by default. It's going to say like, hold on, no, no, no. No, no, I'm gonna, I know you want to set this, but I don't know whether this value is safe or not. Please ensure that it's safe first. Tell me it's safe, and then I'll put it into the page. That's essentially how this message, message translates here. And that means that you have to write some code. So you have to write a function or a way to tell Angular, like, hey, this resource URL is trusted. That's the line here. Bypass security, trust resource URL with this URL. Of course, before you call it, you better make damn sure that it's trusted, that you are sure it's a safe URL. So my recommendation here is never give the user full control over that URL. Because the moment you do that, it's going to be tricky. <coughs> tricky to secure, tricky to ensure it's safe. So if you fix the scheme, the host, and at least a path separator or even a path, then you fix the host where the request is going to. That way you are entirely sure this request is only going to www.youtube.com. And then you give the user control over the untrusted part, the identifier, you merge that into the URL and you're good to go. And then my recommendation here is as a defense and debt mechanism, run it through the default URL sanitizer. The one Angular uses when you put hrefs to an Angular tag, use that to ensure that in case something really crazy happens that Angular is still in the loop to say like, no, no, no. I don't think this is safe, so I'm not going to allow that URL to be used. And this way, you can actually 
ensure that that resource URL is safe and you can put it into the page and Angular will load it at that point. Awesome. Final word on this, use AOT. It's going to be available in development mode automatically from uh, the next version. We heard that in the keynote this morning, which is definitely recommended, because it prevents some weird template injection attacks that existed in Angular 1, uh, where there was no uh, compilation of template code up front. I'm not going to go into detail here, detail here just use it. Uh, there's a lot of benefits, and one of them is security. And that brings me to the first takeaway. That's a message I've been teaching a lot of developers in training courses when we talk about Angular. Uh, well, I talk about multiple frameworks, so the message for Angular is it's actually very easy, just stick to these simple rules. It's a bit messier for other frameworks, but sure. So automatically applies XSS defenses, so that's good. All you need to do is follow the Angular way of doing things. Don't try to fight Angular, don't try to bypass it, just do things as Angular expects, and you're good to go. All right, one down. The next topic is called broken authentication in the OWASP top 10 which is a very generic way of saying everything that has to do with users and session management kind of thing is messy and problematic. So yeah, there's a lot of vulnerabilities there. I'm going to be fairly brief here. I'm going to sketch the landscape, and I'm going to give you some advice and point you to further resources um, right after this talk. So we're mainly dealing with user authentication here. You want to authenticate users. And authentication, well, we all know passwords. We all hate passwords probably, but we know them, and all our users know them as well. But the authentication landscape is insanely complicated. It has gotten really complex in the last five to 10 years. We have attacks like brute forcing. We have attacks like credential stuffing, where they take uh, leaked credentials from other websites and try them out against your applications. We have time-based attacks. All of these are insanely complicated to stop. Password policies, um, account registration, account recovery, and all of that is a lot of effort to build. On top of that, you have multi-factor authentication today with awesome things like YubiKeys, and that means that you'll have to implement support for that in your application as well. And all of that, I can guarantee you, you don't do that in a couple of days. That is months and months of effort, and even then, it's going to be really hard to get that thing secure. So my recommendation today is don't do it. Don't build it. Well, you need some security, so don't throw it all overboard, but offload that to an identity provider. Use something like OpenID Connect, which allows you to have your Angular application rely on an identity provider, and that identity provider will be responsible for handling all of that. If you use Login with Google, awesome. Google will be responsible for handling all of that, and you just have to call them, and you get some result back, and you're good to go. Of course, you don't have to do this with a public identity provider. You can easily use products internally as well. You can buy identity provider products. You can deploy open source solutions. And you have cloud-based services you can use as well, which can be private to your applications. So there's a lot of options here. And it's really, really recommended to go that route, because implementing all of that is really complicated. Honestly, you don't want to be spending your time on that anymore today. If you're using OIDC in combination, you're typically going to use that in combination with OAuth. And now we're entering into a landscape which is insanely complex as well, figuring out how to use OAuth and how to use OIDC and what the right properties and the flows are. And I'm not going to talk about that in detail. There's a session right after mine about authentication in Angular. If you want to know more, go there. I don't know what's going to be covered because I'm going to be in the audience as well. Um, but it's, uh, it's probably highly recommended. They're from Out0. They should know what they're talking about. I want, just want to set a few things straight about OAuth and OIDC. So what you have here is you have the user is authenticating to the identity provider. So if this is login with Google or your internal system, doesn't matter. The user is only authenticating to that system. One place, one place only. If you're building an Angular app, the user is going to interact with your app. And if it's a front-end app only, if you don't have your own backend, if you're using like Google APIs or whatever APIs, then your app is going to be receive an identity token. So the user is actually authenticating to the front-end application, which is kind of meaningless. So you can't really authenticate to a front-end, but at least the front-end knows who the user is, and that user is authenticated at the identity provider. And then the front-end can access a couple of APIs, and it's going to do that with OAuth-based access tokens. So OpenID Connect is all about authenticating to an application, to the front-end in this example, and OAuth is about accessing APIs or resources on behalf of the user. And these are merged together, but also separate concepts. So don't use identity tokens to access APIs, because they're not intended to do that. 
They're supposed to be accessed with OAuth access tokens, which you can get during the same flow. So while you're authenticating, you can get access tokens as well and access APIs. For example, for Google, if you build an Angular front end to manage some Google uh, spreadsheet data, for example, you can ask the user to log in with Google, ask permission to access spreadsheets, and you will get an identity token and an access token. So you know, like, hey, welcome, Philippe, and you can access that spreadsheet with that token instead. That would be one way of doing things. Another way would be if you have your own backend. If you have your own backend application, your Angular app is, again, what the user will interface with, and the Angular app is going to interface with your own backend. In that case, the user is authenticating to your backend application. The user is now going uh, to the identity provider, logging in as Philip with the identity provider, and your backend will now know, like, oh, the user that authenticated was Philip with user ID something something. And the backend can now link that to an internal user. Like, if it's a messaging form, like, oh, this user on the form is actually uh, Dolphins are great. Cool. Um, now we know that dolphins are great authenticated, and we can link that to the data we have internally. Again, the identity is used here to authenticate against the backend application. And the backend can, again, access APIs on behalf of the user if they want to, and they would use OAuth access tokens for that. So these are two very different use cases. They require the use of different flows in these protocols. Uh, but if you have more questions about that, I'd be happy to talk about that later in the expert zone after lunch. But broken authentication, recommendations today, which I always think if developers and most companies have been moving in a direction, is use OpenID Connect. Because you don't want to be implementing this yourself. For accessing resources on behalf of the user, use OAuth 2. That's what it's designed for. You can use both together in a very easy, streamlined fashion. So that's pretty awesome. You don't have to implement many of the dirty details yourself. You can use libraries for that. We have libraries available that support all of these features, so use them. They're highly recommended. I gave you one example on the slides before, and you can find many more online. By the way, if you want to grab a copy of the slides later, they're available on my Twitter feed. You'll find a link, and you can grab them from there as well. All right. One more. The last one is about using vulnerable components in your application. That's a problem. And especially in Angular, it's a real problem. Because over 97% of applications are dependent, of application code are dependencies nowadays. 97% of your code or your application is code you are pulling in from the internet. And I know that 97% is like, that seems like a lot. So how much is it really? Well, I ran the numbers a while ago. If you generate a new clean Angular application with that command, it's going to ask you some questions, like, do you want routing? Like, yeah, sure we want. And you want to use some uh, SAS or whatever? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, it's going to run npm install in the background, so it's going to take a while. <laughs> but after about 30 seconds, it's going to come back and say, like, yeah, we installed 1,169 packages from 1,030 contributors. Like, yeah, that's, that's kind of a lot. So you're now running code from 1,000 developers. That's impressive. But how much is that really? Well, let's count the lines of code. There's an NPM module to count the lines of code. So you install that NPM module, and then you can start counting lines of code. You'll find a lot of languages in there. But the interesting part is you'll find that you're now including 2,336,228 lines of code. This is a real number. This puts things into context. We're building a new Angular app. We have written zero lines of code, yet our application is 2,336,228 lines of code. That's what we're talking about here. That's a lot of code. That's a lot of code you're trusting on to not be vulnerable. Because this, this is built by developers, a lot of them free or volunteer developers, freelancers, people doing this for the, out of the good of their heart. And they all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. So one of these mistakes can be a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Oops. One of these mistakes can be God knows what. That can happen. So what if that happens in one of these dependencies? Then it's a problem for that library. They can update that. But now your, your program, your application is also vulnerable because you have that dependency with that vulnerability. So you'll need to update that. And this is something that will go on and go on 
like that. And that's only about legitimate mistakes, accidental vulnerabilities. This ecosystem is under a lot of attack lately because this is a very lucrative attack vector. Let me, explain, let me tell you one example story. It's not necessarily an Angular story. It was uh, an addition to our to the React ecosystem, but it doesn't matter because it can happen to anyone. Let me explain to you what happened. There's a company uh, called uh, Commodo, I think. They, they built um, a product to manage your cryptocurrency in a wallet. Very, very sensitive. That's real money. Depends on what day it is, how much money, but you kind of get the idea. And the attacker, in this case, went, it was an open source application. They went to GitHub and they said, like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if the application was an Electron app running on the desktop, if we would be able to use like native notifications, like the Mac OS notifications or the Windows notifications? That would be cool, right? And the product owners were like, yeah, actually, that would be cool. And the attacker was like, do you want me to create a pull request for that? And they were like, uh, yes, please, do that. So the attacker went to work. He created a package called Electron Notify Native, which does exactly that. It allows to hook into that API from the operating system, and they published that in NPM, and they created a pull request using that library and added that to the application. And two days later, that was included by the target application. So we went, in about two weeks' time, we went from, hey, wouldn't this be cool to, here's a pull request, you can integrate that in your application. And everybody was happy, because it's a legitimate feature added by a volunteer, so awesome. That's, that's what makes the community beautiful, right? That's what we all depend on, and what we all hope is gonna happen in our community. And then, the attacker said, like, interesting. So, you have now included my dependency, and they updated their package to include malicious code. So they pushed out an update, they increased the version number, and they said, like, you know what? Now it's gonna do this notification, plus a little bit extra. A little bit extra was not good extra, so. <laughs> it actually included code to steal the seeds from the wallets and publish them on a server somewhere so they could build up a database to get access to all of these wallets at the same time. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, the target application, the wallet system in this case, included that dependency and deployed that. So at that moment, the malicious code started running, started collecting these seeds, publishing them on a server, and just waiting to grab all the money. This is bad. This is, this is a targeted attack against one application. The, there's a plot twist now. The good part is NPM tries to do as much as they can, and they actively scan libraries for potential malware. They have patterns to detect that. And they detected this, and they said, like, uh-oh, this is not good. And they contacted the company and said, like, yeah, we have a problem. And they looked at it and they said, like, yeah, we have a problem. Because the, 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 the seeds were already stolen, so the libraries, are the, the wallets were already accessible by the attacker if they decided to do so. And they eventually decided, like, what are we going to do with that? And this is real movie material here. They actually stole everybody's money using that vulnerability and put it in a safe location. So they transferred all the money to a safe location, out of reach for the attacker, and then they set up a whole process where users could reclaim their wallets through the proper procedures and get access to their money again. But this is to show you what we have to deal with today. Any of these dependencies in your application can become malicious at any time. Whether it's intentional or because of a mistake or because someone breaking into NPM, into that specific account and publishing an update, all of that can really happen. And we need to be aware of that. And there's not much we can do against these active attacks except be vigilant. There are a few things you can do in your applications and you should set up dependency scanning today. Because there's a lot of these known vulnerabilities. We know that version X of library Y is vulnerable to this attack. But if you haven't updated your libraries in a while, then you might have that vulnerable version. But you don't even know that until you set up dependency scanning. GitHub has a free service, the dependency graph. And they scan your package.json or whatever you're using, and they tell you, like, these libraries are vulnerable. Update now, please. OWASP has a similar tool called dependency check. It can run in offline mode, supports a few different languages. Really awesome software. They just scan against known vulnerabilities and they fix or they tell you about that. And SNCC is a commercial company. They have something very similar with a lot of good features and they offer a free version for open source developers as well. So you need to be aware of this. You need to set up dependency scanning. It's really, really, really important that you do so so you can update your libraries as soon as possible. And that brings us back towards the beginning. So we talked about the top three. There's seven more if you want to collect them all. Um, some people like that. Talk to me at the expert zone, so I'll be happy to uh, go into depth into all of these topics. To wrap it up, 
I built an Angular security sheet sheet, uh, which you can grab from my website. So if you go there, or if you go to Twitter, you'll find that link as well. Uh, you can grab like a nice overview of things to watch out for in Angular applications. And with that, I have zero time left, so I'm going to wrap it up. And I'm going to thank you for being here. Follow me on Twitter for more security news, and talk to me at the conference while I'm around. Thank you.